what's interesting is how much impact a great movie villain will have with so little screen time. When you think about villains, what are the characters who come to mind? Well, I would say the greatest villain in movie history is Darth Vader. That, that would be a, a great villain that comes to mind. Uh, Hans Gruber in Die Hard, I think is, is also an incredible villain. Boy, the, I mean, here's what's interesting. The villains tend to always be more interesting than the, the protagonist and the hero. Why? I, I, I think the reason that villains are much more interesting and much more popular than the heroes is, and I'm sorry to say this, I think they're relatable because they speak to a darker version of ourselves that exists in all of us that we resist. And the villain is caught up in a, you know, in at least not necessarily the villain, but but as an audience member, we're caught up in the like, oh, well, you know, I'd never do that, but I guess Darth Vader would do this thing that I would never do, right? And it's it's always a, a battle internally over morality. And I think what makes villains interesting, especially really well-crafted villains, is that they don't think what they're doing is wrong. From their perspective, from the villain's point of view, they're right. I mean, there's a reason that, you know, there is the term Thanos was right, right? Like Thanos's mission was to set the galaxy right and wipe out half of all life in the galaxy so that other life could thrive. Uh, there's a lot of logic that doesn't work, quite work in the Marvel Avengers series, you know, that, that Thanos ended up being the, the main villain of, but people kind of look at that and say, well, he has a point, you know? He has a point about, you know, wasting resources of, you know, so that's where that term Thanos was right came from. And he is, you know, at least in the movie Infinity War, he's such a big part of that film. It really is his journey through parts of the Marvel universe right, experiencing all of these heroes that, you know, we've come to see through their own individual movies. And in uh, Infinity War, you're, you're on Thanos' journey. He's the lead character of Infinity War. He's the one that is influencing all of the events. Um, and what's interesting is when you look at the screen time for villains, this is, what, this is what's amazing is you can see a movie that has a great movie villain like a Star Wars, whether it's you know, the original series or Anakin Skywalker in, in the prequels. And what's interesting is how much impact a great movie villain will have with so little screen time. Very little screen time. But the villain influences all of the other characters in the movie because the protagonist is constantly having to react to some something that the main villain is responsible for, always. They're the one that's like, even though they may not be present on screen, the villain, the main villain in a story is always the, the person that is influencing events. So, and Darth Vader to me is the culmination of probably some of the best aspects of, of villains from all types, uh, you know, whether it be from you know, movie serials or comic books. Uh, it's fairly easy to argue that Dar Darth Vader was very influenced by Doctor Doom from the Fantastic Four comic books created by Stan Lee. Uh, the look of Darth Vader kind of based on that, also based on a little bit of a samurai in there um, in terms of the helmet and, and other aspects of Darth Vader's character and the fact that it took, you know, uh, you know, David Prowse as an actor uh, 
and then James Earl Jones as a voice actor to kind of create this and also the physical look, you know, the costume designers and and whatnot and, and Ralph Bakshi to kind of design the character or versions of the character to what it became on screen. So, so much went into the creation of Darth Vader as a villain and that Darth Vader has a tragic backstory that only a piece of it becomes revealed in the second movie in which Darth Vader appeared, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, you know, villains have layers. Heroes are pretty much like, I wanna do the good thing, I'm gonna resist doing the bad thing. Okay, uh, villains, there's much more tragedy, pain, trauma, and I think that th that actually makes them more relatable. Not in the sense that we would want to act out uh, and or emulate any of the things that a, a, a villain on screen would do. In particular, say, villains from Quentin Tarantino movies, right? They were the you know, main antagonists of those, of those, of Quentin Tarantino's films. But like, it's a way to kind of like exercise your own demons, right? Like, and, and that's why I think that movie villains are so popular. And that's why I think that I don't even think I need to look at a poll. I'm I'm certain that if you looked up best movie villains, Darth Vader is gonna be in the number one, if not in the top three position. And and I think that they'll always be a source of fascination. I think I think that of late though, it's gotten to the point now where there's a deconstruction of villains. Okay, it's like, well, what led to this person becoming the villain, right? With movies like Cruella or even the Star Wars prequels, right? Like what led to this person? They started out as good, but then they became bad. Well, what is that journey like? And that's become a whole other genre unto itself, right? The deconstruction of a movie villain and showing it from their point of view. And I guess from Darth Vader's point of view, you know, he wanted to set the galaxy right. And, you know, uh, so from Darth Vader's point of view, from Anakin Skywalker's point of view, he was doing the right thing. I don't know. I, and I, I think that, you know, from Thanos' point of view, the same thing. From other great movie villains' point of views, you know, they had a mission they were trying to fulfill. I just think that um, villains always tend to be the most interesting characters. Are villains always the most unlikable or is unlikability and villain two separate characters? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Un, Unlikeability is, I, I, I don't know. It's like an um, unlikable in, in the sense of, you know, I mean, you're gonna like the villain, otherwise the hero has no journey, right? Uh, and, and yeah, I think unlikable is, you know, maybe a term be better used for like a side character or, or whatnot, or an unlikable character, um, might be better way to describe Han Solo in the first Star Wars movie, where he was kind of, uh, he was selfish, he was out for himself, he only cared about money, didn't care about the cause that the that uh, Princess Leia was on, and he was, you know, parts of him were unlikable. He was still, it's look, it's Harrison Ford, he's a very attractive man, that chiseled jaw. Sure. I'm very envious of that ch right. chiseled jaw. Be right? mean like, to me, yeah. Exactly, he beats me, <laughs> so, but he's, you know, um, He's unlikable and has a redemption, right? So that redemption arc is important, not just, you know, and, and we've seen it happen more with villains. Uh, I don't think necessarily Thanos had a redemption arc, um, you know, but the story of Darth Vader is a redemption arc, which is a very Christian story. What about female villains? Yeah. Because uh... if, if you, oh, sorry to interrupt, but Walter yeah, no. White's wife in Breaking Bad, was she really a villain? Or was she just unlikable? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would probably say unlikable, but from her point of view, I feel like the audience can relate to the you know the moral dilemma that she's faced with, which influences her decision making. So I I don't know that I would consider her necessarily a villain, but but you know unlikable in the sense that Walter White is you know. He's, he's our guy, he's the, it's right, you the stories, understand. stories yeah. about him. Mm -hmm. And, but I, but I feel some empathy for her 
from the standpoint of, well, she's making the decisions for what she thinks is best. So while I, while I would understand with some understand and empathize with her decision making, wouldn't necessarily agree with it. Was there a villain in Amelie? I mean, look, I think, I, I think, I think the villain in Amelie was Amelie's agoraphobia, really, and her um, ability to relate to other people. That was the thing that she needed to overcome. Here she is, kind of in love with the world, but this shy, quiet girl who, you know, um, has, uh, you know, she she gains this, you know, delight over connecting people with with some aspect of them that that reawakens some love, right? Which begins with that little box of toys and the the. And, and, and her journey, the, the sort of, you know, like she's she's doing good in that sense. But then, you know, the person, she's thinking about all these other people and how she can kind of help them along the way. And she's she thinks about herself last, right? Uh, but, but then that journey becomes about her, you know, overcoming her own agoraphobia. I don't know if that could be considered a villain in the movie, but it's certainly the challenge that the protagonist must overcome. And I would say a mild case of agoraphobia. Uh, in her case. Sure. It's not like panic. No, really no, no. Panic, but, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she she repelled from connecting with a with someone who could be a lover for her. She repelled from it and she walked away fearful from it. She resisted it. And, and then it comes full force. That's such a great movie. Amelie is such a such a movie that is in a category all its own. That defies, you, you know, a, a, you know, it's such a simple story and yet a complex one all at once. And it's not a story that is told well very often. So having seen it in the theater when it first came out, and I mean that movie is is just incredible. Who are some of the smartest villains you can think of? Well. I don't know that I would classify them as smart. I, I actually like when there's a decent Bond villain, but the fact that they keep getting tripped up by Bond means they're not very good villains. You know, it's, I mean, it's almost, it's almost laughable or comical um, that so many movie villains, I feel like these movie villains should watch movies with other villains because then they'd see kind of like the roots of their mistakes which is one, um, the main cause of death of a movie villain is falling from a high place. So don't be anywhere high. Like if you're gonna construct a throne room in a half-constructed Death Star, try not to put it somewhere where there's a chasm where you could fall to your death. I'm referencing, of course, uh, the Return of the Jedi and, and the Emperor and his untimely demise. Or did he die? I don't know, it was never really explained. Uh, in any case, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think the smartest villains are always kind of several steps ahead of the protagonist. And I mean, to me, the, uh, the trio of villains in the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think, are, I think were great because at the end, you know, Indiana Jones did not win. He simply kept his eyes closed when they when they opened the ark. So he was immune to the dark spirits that were released from the ark. But Belloc and his, you know, the 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 his his cohorts were all taken out by their carelessness, their, you know, their their lust for power, right? Of, Getting the ark. I, I, I feel I feel that what a lot of people forget about, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, is that you know Indiana Jones doesn't win. He he fails. He fails in the end. The villains win, and then they become a victim of their of you know their own hubris. They're you know they're taken out by the the deceased spirits. It was never really explained. 